Hello, I'm Michael Kurland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Be Better podcast with me, your host, Michael Kurland. Very excited today to have longtime friend, uh, longtime cohort, Taylor Martin on from Design Positive. Uh, Taylor, I'm so excited to have you on the show. You've been with us since the inception of Branded Group. You actually, like literally, are part of the inception of Branded Group. You, you, know, you helped us design our logo before we were even were anything other than two words. And uh, really excited to have you here. So welcome to the show, Taylor. Why don't you uh, tell the audience uh, what exactly that is that you do for Design Positive and uh, give them a little bit about your background. You bet. Pleasure to be here, Mike. Thanks so much. And I'm so glad you're doing this podcast. I really enjoy, you know, the positive energy that you're putting out into the world. I mean, Design Positive, that's where our business is kind of revolving around. We work with a lot of organizations that are doing something good in the world. And uh, they don't have to be, you know, curing cancer, but, you know, we do have some that are (laughs) trying to do that. But, um, you know, companies like yourself, I think you're a great beaming light for other organizations, you know, small, medium, and large or whatever, to learn how to do something good with their with their company, not just you know profit only. You know, for Branded Group, you know, uh, we knew uh, John, uh, and John is the one that introduced us. Um, and um, you know, I think I think the biggest thing that uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, Cage, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. So just cut this out. <laughs> um, let's see here. It's a, it's a good thing when you know that we both use the same uh, editor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Cage is great, man. He is awesome. Um, let me just say, so we were talking about uh, what I did for a branded group. No, we were saying uh, what you do and, and Design Positive does. Let's, right. let's talk right. about that. Okay. All right. Back on it, Cage. So, you know, what we do here at, brand, at Design Positive, uh, we focus on, I'd say, like three things really well. Uh, building brands. Um, creating brands or rebranding an organization or kind of helping a a company uh, re-energize a brand by all different types of means because a brand is more than just a logo. And then another third part would be website design. And we're very passionate about doing web designs that are accessible. We're very passionate about making accessible websites look beautiful. And I, I feel like we really accomplished that with the website that we did for you guys at Branded Group. We're very happy with that one. Yeah, I, and was, then I, I was sorry to cut you off. I was just going to say, I mean, you've done all of those things for Branded Group. So if anyone would like to get a close <laughs> that's right. personal look at, at Design Positive's work, just check out our website. Sorry, Taylor, keep yep. going. No, that's okay. Uh, another third part that we do of our business is you know, a lot of print material. We do some high level uh, engagement through print, like annual reports, CSRs, ESG reports, as well as, you know, just a plethora of all different types of marketing materials, brochures and promotional items, and just you name it, you know, even billboards and signs and posters, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and that, that's kind of the, the world in which we live in. But, you know, speaking about accessibility, um, that's one of the things, accessibility and sustainability are two items that are very near and dear to our heart. And we try to work that into um, all different avenues of our work for design positive, whether a company is, is not in the sustainable space, well, we can help them be sustainable in their marketing efforts and what they do. And then same thing for accessibility, you know, even things we do for the government where everything has to be accessible, even a printed you know, poster or eight F by 11 PDF. I mean, the PDF itself has to be, program to be accessible and that's a whole nother long discussion i'm not going to go into but uh just because i'm really upset of how how time inducive it is to make a uh, pdf accessible it's just crazy but anyway i digress um so we, we do a lot but it's you know it all revolves around the brand you know when you guys came to us 
you know, six years ago, you know, we sat down and we had, you know, a fair amount of questionnaires to go over and everything. And we talked about, you know, your vision and what you guys wanting to do and where you were wanting to go and the tone that you guys wanted. And I always focus so much on the tone. And that was the part I think that really resonated with all of us at the table. We really defined the tone of Branded Group and where you wanted to launch from and, and the, the image you wanted to, you know, put out there. And I think that has been our guiding um, you know, post to, to aim for. And we're always moving it back and redirecting it. But um, for the most part, I, you know, it's been a journey from day one. And I, I think we've been doing a great job, you know, pushing it forward, especially like I mentioned with the new website. I, I mean, I, I have to agree. Obviously, our relationship's been ongoing for over six years. We've never gone anywhere else for any branding, any website, re- design, redesign, logo design. So, and I, I think I've referred I don't know how many people to you and, and, you and, and only, you know, because you're the best, uh, you're the best at what you do. So, so I have to say, um, you know, you, you are great at everything in, in those three realms that you spoke of, but how long have you been doing this for? Like, how did you get into this? Where, where did this come from? Oh my God. Good question. So I, um, I'm a, a lover of information and data and that's analytics. why you're friends with John Thomas, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just I just find the world fascinating, and I love business. I love business as an entity. I just love the the mechanisms of it and how it operates as a as an entity. And um, so I went into my first job was in advertising, and then I turned right around and started a business in a map mapping business. Um, and then I went into a magazine publication, and I was the art director for that and art style and literature magazine which was really fun and then i went into uh, uh publications nationwide uh for nonprofits, and i got into the nonprofit world later i went into um advocacy advertising which is really a powerful thing in washington dc where i used to live and some of the things we would do would be literally in 24 hours because you know you had to be in the paper the very next day with your talking points, rebuttaling whatever is going on in the Hill. And that, that was very exciting, but extremely intense and fast paced, which I just loved. And it it forced me to have to narrow big ideas down to very small, digestible, easy to understand messaging. Uh, And then I spent eight years working on annual reports and building brands for uh, very large organization, publicly traded companies. Um, some of them were Fortune 500 organizations and for the government as well, being in DC, they're all over around you. And then um, a- after that, I just realized, you know, I've kind of seen and done so many different things uh, that I decided I need to go off on my own and really push this, you know, forward in the way that I want to do it and work with the clients I want to work with. And that's when I focused on sustainability. That's really what um, drove my force forward. And then once I learned about accessibility, well, then that that changed everything. And I I just uh, folded that into our services. So you keep bringing up sustainability and accessibility. That's obviously something that you guys are very passionate about. And I can totally uh, get get on board with that. But for our audience, talk, you know, uh, sustainability is, is an obvious thing, right? Like, you're trying to reduce the uh, carbon, the carbon footprint, right? You're trying to make sure that their things are are available via online only and there's no there's no paper am i am i wrong is there anything else i'm missing on that no there's a lot of things about a sustainability that you know can uh, a company can do like for instance even our hosting server for our website is on which i can't believe i'm saying this but it's still the only server hosting server in the united states that is completely on their own solar grid they literally have a solar grid in their farm outside their building and all that power supports all the servers inside the building. Cool. Oh wow! Everybody. So you've like you've really gone to the next level with that. And what's yeah. what's the name of that uh, uh, hosting? A A I S O dot net. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we yeah, go. I, 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 I think I think they're still new. the only one because a lot of people will just use what they what they call Rex. They'll buy Rex to offset their you know emissions that they're doing. And you know Rex are great. It's a taxation that you're paying for to offset your you know um, your um, carbon footprint. 
but really the best thing to do is to find someone like AISO.net and um, just have somebody who has really invested in solar servers. I mean, that's really what they do. That's yeah. That's great. So, so it's a, you know, the carton, the, the no non use of paper, we got some solar servers, but talk to me more, more about web accessibility because when we were redesigning my website, that was a big talking point for you. And you were just, you know, hammering at home that we need it to be web accessible. And I still don't quite 100% understand it. So for our listening audience, let's give them a tutorial 101 in, in web accessibility and you why bet. it's important to you. Oh my God. Um, well, I'll tell you though, the biggest thing about web accessibility is that it's for people with disabilities. Um, if people have low vision or if they just can't interact with the computer like you and I do, they have some sort of disability. Um, there are a host of software and hardware out there in the world that allow them to interact with their, with the web. Uh, the only problem is there are certain codes and restrictions and uh, processes that you use. Uh, they're known as section 508. And then WCAG, uh, the current standard is 2.1 AA. There used to be 2.0, but 2.1 was two years ago. And things have shifted um, over to 2.1, which is more mobile friendly. And if you design the visual of your website in a high contrast way for people with low vision, and then it's coded in a way so that people can interact with it with these third party hardware and software items, then that allows them full access to everything on your site. Now you think, okay, that's great. You know, you're doing good. You're making people accessible, but I got to tell you only like 10% of the internet is accessible, which is just maddening. And to be quite honest, when I found this out, uh, I, I was dumped at it. I didn't know what accessibility was. And when I did, that literally changed us, that, that, that changed the name of my business from Vox Verde, which was, you know, green voice about sustainability to design positive because we realized we wanted to fold accessibility into our work because that was a positive thing we could put out into the world. And we were very passionate about that. We have always been passionate about it. But the thing that people don't understand, and you have to talk about this, this is the bottom line, right? Oh, it's going to cost me more money to make our website accessible. You know, back in the day, it was a lot more heavy lifting, but now it's not so much heavy lifting involved. And when you do make a website accessible, your SEO goes up. So you're getting more eyeballs, you're getting more SEO equity out there with your website. The robots can crawl your website better and know what you're known for. Um, and then, um, you know, you also increase your engagement to, you know, a larger population of people. Uh, if you have, you know, only 10% of the internet's accessible to people with disabilities, you know, you're gonna fall into that 10 or 11% now. And now you're going to have a bigger audience and you'd be amazed at how many people um, will go to a website and that they just can't, you know, interact with it. Well, even if they just have low vision, they bounce, they jump. And so th those are things that are really important. Now, the one thing I call the, the dark part is that your business can be sued. Yeah. That, that was the one thing I was just going to raise. You had mentioned that when we were redesigning uh, branded branded group.com branded hyphen group.com that uh, that <laughs> that we could be sued if we didn't have uh, our an accessible website and you know that obviously caught my attention as a business owner so talk a little bit more about that yep so approximately for the last two years there's been a little over six businesses a day uh, being sued for not having an accessible website and you think oh it's not going to happen to me we have attorneys calling us, you know, saying, can you make this website accessible? Uh, we're in litigation right now because our client is being sued. How soon can you do it? And uh, all those things. And um, it's been a range of companies. Um, the larger the brand, that doesn't mean the larger the, the, the company in terms of revenue, it's just the larger it is in the face of the public, I think the larger the target. Uh, but there have been some small businesses that have been sued because they wanted access to a website and they can't gain access to it because of their disabilities. And, um, you know, no one wants to have their name drug through the mud for being sued. But if you look up uh, web accessibility in Domino's, that was a huge, huge case uh, that, um, that cost them, I don't even know how much money, but it was ridiculous. And they could have spent a fraction of that to make their website and their mobile app accessible. 
and not have had any of that problems. But even someone like Beyonce has been sued for not having a, an accessible website. Wow. And in this litigious society that we do live, that's, that's uh, correct. that is something that you want to button up real quick. So all the listeners out there that have your own websites, web accessibility, give Taylor a ring. He can definitely help <laughs> you out with that. <laughs> so that's, that's definitely some good information. And uh, I'm glad we were able to share that. That's definitely being better, you know, for, for the website and for the accessibility. And I'm glad you're passionate about that. And I do remember when, when you first started working with us, you were at the very tail end of uh, Vox for a day and you had just changed to design positive. And uh, now, now I know the story behind that. So now you know. great, great, great information there. So, you know, in, in the current time that we're in, uh, you know, everyone's in the work from home, but you guys have always been uh, a virtual business, I would assume, correct? That's correct. You know, our digital directors in Seattle, uh, our art director and myself are in Austin, Texas, but, you know, we hardly ever meet, you know, we always say we should go meet for coffee, but now that it's COVID time, it's like, we'll have coffee, you know, on Zoom or something. Uh, and then we have uh, writers on the East Coast and designers in DC. So everybody's in their own little place and everybody's, you know, enjoying their life the way they want to and they make their own schedule. And we have an online collaboration platform that we use so that everybody's on the same page and nothing falls through the cracks and it makes, you know, easy access to, you know, who has to do what. But yeah, when COVID happened, it was just like, it was another day in the office for us. It, it didn't, nothing changed for us whatsoever. It's just that all of a sudden now we're doing a lot more Zoom meetings because everybody wants to be on a Zoom meeting as opposed to, you know, meeting in person, but that's about it. I, I, can, I can attest to that. We uh, ha obviously had a spike in Zoom meetings as well, but the thing we really had a spike in was Zoom happy hours. And it, it was just every week, everyone from the team or one of our clients wanted to, you know, get some interaction, which I think is very important right now mm -hmm. and have a, a Zoom happy hour. And, and I, I mentioned this uh, before, but... The problem with Zoom happy hours is that you are your own bartender and sometimes you don't know when to cut yourself off. <laughs> so, so the Zoom hangover is a real thing, but, uh, but, but I digress. So, <laughs> so <laughs> on your website, your homepage has uh, a simple statement, designing for brands that drive positive change. So tell me a little bit of how that statement came to be. And is that your mission statement? You know, it was a statement that, that just, we just kept talking about what we want to stand for and what we want to do and who we want to work for all in one. And, you know, it's always difficult to condense something down and it's always the hardest to do it for yourself. You know, we do it for other companies and it just seems so easy and effortless, but when we do it for ourselves, you know, it's like the cobbler, you know, doesn't have in his own shoes, you know, it's just that story. So we kept talking about it in the conversational speak and we realized, you know, we just want to design for brands that drive positive change in the world. We didn't want to say just nonprofits or, um, you know, people that are trying to cure cancer or things like that. Just any company that can do anything, but they want to do something beyond just the bottom line, you know? And so that's how it came about. And we're, we're actually um, redesigning our website, you know, and that, that of course takes so much time because we're incredibly nitpicking of everything we do. Right. But we're also working. <laughs> oh my God, we so are. But, you know, we're also working on a new mission statement. So I have to say, you know, stay tuned for that one. I don't have an answer yet for that. one. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to that. And yeah, I mean, I mean, you got to have the perfect website, right? Because that's part of what you're selling. I mean, yep. if you, if someone goes to your website and says, what is this? Maybe they're not going to hire you, but I'm sure that, you know, even with all the good creatives you got over there and everything that I've ever seen you produce, you guys will have a great web website redesign. It'll just probably, like you said, take way longer than you would hope. Yeah, it's about, oh my God, it's so much bigger than what we have. And it's just so much more complex and so much more integrated with all different types of things. So that's the reason why it's taken so long. Oh man, It's not just, just going to be a portfolio website. We're, we're not doing that anymore. Right. I mean, I mean, I remember, so you designed our first website, just to touch on that for a second, back in uh, 20, I, I guess it was like early, late 2013, early 2014, when we were just yep. getting off the ground. And there was like, you know, I, get, I don't want to, I don't think technology is the right word, but you know, the tech for the websites back then and what was hot and in was whatever. And then we did the redesign about a year and a half ago. And it's changed. I mean, obviously it changed so much, but like so much that 
everything we did five years prior was just it was like what, using a Betamax like VCR <laughs> compared to like I don't even know what it is a Blu-ray today. So yeah, anyway, exactly. I, got, I got to say I'm sure like I know it was painstaking for us to do all that in a good way, right? Because you make sure that we have all of our details covered. So I'm sure your your people are doing the same. So, so you know you you work with us at Branded Group, but what are some of the other kinds of businesses you work with? You know, tell me some some interesting some names, some some good stories from from your world. We don't we don't get a lot of uh, web web design and marketing companies on here. So curious. Okay. So you know we do a fair amount of um, nonprofits. I mean we've done you know annual reports for even like Greenpeace, but we've also done work oh, wow. for the World Bank. And I, I like telling people that story from one to the other because the World Bank is trying to do their good their way, and uh, we you know help brand their their corporate sustainability department within the organization and how it communicates all around the world. And uh, I've had a background in um, developing the brand for International Finance Corporation, their very first style guide, which was like a a year long endeavor that took talking to people in all different countries and everything. It was a nuts. But, um, you know, I like being able to work with any type of organization, but some of the interesting ones we've done, you know, we've done work with uh, uh, this organization that's tied to another organization. One's called Practice Green Health and one's called Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, the two nonprofits, they do a lot of joint venture uh, businesses together, you know. Um, and one of the things we just finished for them was this enormous uh, procurement guide uh, for sustainability purposes. And it's basically, it's going to affect all of us, this, this, report, this, this guide, this report because it's helping hospitals understand how and why they need to be more sustainable, not just uh, for a bottom line purpose, but for all the different things, the, the full circle, the um, circular economy for um, a hospital. Because hospitals, you know, they buy and sell and there's just so much consumption and, you know, and then they treat people in an environment that they're trying to create to be even more healthy. And then they're also changing the way they actually feed people at um, hospitals, even talking about, you know, having hospitals growing their own food. So you're going to see a lot of changes in that. And that, that, that's been a really excitement, uh, exciting project to work on. That's, um, that's interesting. And uh, I know from my past days, uh, hospitals, I used to sell industrial equipment and hospitals, one of the ways that they um, energize, it's probably not the right word, but they, they make energy for their buildings as they burn that some of them still burn their own like waste and that Mm -hmm. you know and that's definitely not a a sustainable thing right it's not Mm -hmm. not for clean and green so um you know i i know this information so much i could just go a little bit deeper in the weeds on that one but they had a campaign to um post above all those red trash cans you see at the hospital because red are the biohazard that's Mm -hmm. the one you're talking about those are the ones that they they uh, have to burn because uh, of bio waste. Sure. And uh, they had, you know, a poster that we helped them design that specified what goes in and what does not. And the problem was is because uh, people that were might have been visiting somebody in the hospital and they just look around for a trash can and they just see that one, they just put something in it. And we had to do a campaign and then they had to put two trash cans next to it one with biohazard one not you couldn't have one without the other kind of thing so wow. yeah that's and then crazy. that reduces the amount of energy to burn and the waste from the burn and you know how it's a domino effect right exactly well I, yeah, exactly it's the same thing with uh you know organically grown uh the thought process behind it i i once was taken to school by someone when i said ah, why why am i gonna eat an organic banana you know, it's in a, it's in a shell, right? It's in its own little, uh, wrapper. And they were like, mm-hmm. well, it's the soil and the water table and this and that. And I was like, well, I am going to be quiet and learn more about organically <laughs> grown things before I open my mouth again. So, so I can appreciate that. So Taylor, I was recently on your podcast, uh, the triple bottom line. And obviously I really enjoyed our conversation and I consider myself a practicing conscious capitalist. And I've heard of the triple bottom line many times, but for our audience, can you explain to them what that really is, what it means? 
Sure. So in 1994, John Elkinson was a, he's a financial um, person that he's in, uh, I believe he's in London, England. He came up with the phrase, coined the phrase, triple bottom line. And the triple bottom line in a nutshell is basically people, planet and profit. So we all know what the bottom line is, but if you looked at the bottom line in terms of, you know, profitable or not profitable, what if you looked at it in a sense of people? You know, are we helping people or hindering people or hurting people? Or are we improving the lives of people? And it could be anybody. It could be, you know, the social stratus of your company and all the different people from manufacturing to shipping to the people that actually use your product or service, the whole, the whole gamut. And then the planet side, you know, are you helping the planet or hindering the planet? Are you hurting the planet, damaging the planet, or are you helping the planet in some way? And uh, that's really what the triple bottom line is. And, you know, this is in 1994, when this was coined and it, you know, it, it has caught on in some circles in the sustainability circles. And now we have sustainability officers and larger corporations and things like that. And now it's kind of evolved into what's called the ESG, um, which is um, environmental social governance. And that's been taking off and it's a lot more stringent in terms of uh, the requirements to do an ESG report for an organization, unlike the CSR report. Uh, which is good. More stringency, you know, means that people are more, um, uh, they have to jump through bigger hoops and to make things more valid and, and um, more compliance to, uh, you know, be more sustainable and of course, more triple bottom line focus. But the triple bottom line actually was the precursor of the ESG. I say that just because ESG is just more of a top subject. I, I went back to the triple bottom line because it was a near and dear to my heart. It really, changed me a long time ago. So I started the Triple Bottom Line podcast um, because of that. And um, I, I love it. I love podcasting, as you know. I love being on your show. And um, um, I, th I think if everybody, you know, did their company with a mindset of a Triple Bottom Line, I think the world would be a much better place. Even, I totally agree. And I, I think that's why we've always, you know, aligned with everything that we've done together over the years yep. is, I mean, Branded Group, uh, although we don't call it the triple bottom line, we definitely do it. I mean, you know, we're doing beach cleanups and, and ocean sustainability. We're helping with uh, feeding the community and uh, building homes for the for the community. Uh, and obviously, hopefully, um, turning a profit, which, which we've been doing okay for the last couple of years. So, yeah, I want to say one thing that um, you've mentioned on one of your previous podcasts that you know, I, I thought it, it actually made an impression on me. Uh, I can't remember which, which episode it was, but you were talking about, you know, even small businesses um, doing something good. Don't, don't keep moving the, ball, the goal, um, goal post back. Uh, you can always do something good, even if it's small. And you kind of, you got me when you, when you said that, because I have been guilty of moving the goal post back. And what it was is um, I always wanted to like when I my company got big enough or I had t more time or whatever, I was going to, you know, get into planting trees for, you know, the, the work that we do with our clients, like every project we plant a tree and everything. And I just kept pushing it back, pushing it back. I'll do it later, do it later. But I got to tell you, when I heard that podcast and I heard you say that, I was like, you know what? He's talking to me. <laughs> He's talking to me. <laughs> And so uh, we're, we're, we're working with uh, Trees for the Future. Okay. They are um, trees.org, if you want to look it up. Uh, they're one of the first ones that uh, um, were, built, were planting trees many, many years ago. And it was just uh, a small group of people that got together to do it. Now it's a much, much larger organization. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think is so amazing that they do is they don't just plant trees. What they do, they have a social aspect to it, which you know brings in the triple bottom line for me in a sense, is that they just don't go out and plant trees. They find people that have farms that need help and they show them how to plant trees properly, strategically on their land to help them get more out of their land. And it's like a four year program. And by the time they get through four years, they, the outcome of their farm for their family is increased exponentially. And they're also cooling that part of their land. And then after that, 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 that farmer and their team become ambassadors. And then they go and they help other people do that. So it's a, it's a pain forward thing. And it's mostly in, I think, it's, I think it might only be in um, Africa, but if you look at the heat map of the, of the world, Africa has got so much 
um, uncovered land that we need it there most. So right. I have to, I have to say, uh, I, it's, it's because of you that I'm actually, you know, kicking myself, you know, in the rear and, and moving forward and, and going to make this happen. So once it's all said and done, I'm going to plant like a hundred trees just for you, man. Well, I'm glad that we were able to inspire you in some way. And honestly, if uh, you need any help on that, we would, uh, we'd happy to partner with you on planting some trees. That'd be great. I, I, I'd love it. It sounds good. Good for the environment. So cool. sign me up. Well, uh, I will. I'll, pull, I'll forward some information to you. Thanks, Taylor. Well, I just wanted to uh, say thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, if our listeners here want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Uh, you can always go to designpositive.co. And uh, if you want to, you can also follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, or Twitter. We're always uh, pushing out all different types of sustainability and accessibility and branding and marketing and strategic branding um, tidbits. You can also join our, um, our mailing list at designpositive.co. And if you want to engage us or if you have any questions about these things that we've talked about today, I'm, I'm more than happy to jump on a call with somebody and, and get them educated and get them up and going. Awesome, Taylor. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for coming on the show and uh, we will hopefully have you back on in a couple more episodes and celebrating some trees being planted. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thanks so much for having me. I really, I really enjoyed this. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There's no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better.